The Process of Production of Capital Part 1. Commodities and Money The wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense collection of commodities. The individual commodity appears as its elementary form. Our investigation therefore begins with the analysis of the commodity. What is the perspective from which Marx is saying this? It is the perspective of materialist dialectics. There's a certain method which he is using, and we're not going to get very far in reading this if we don't engage with trying to understand his method. To quote Bertel Ullmann in Dance of the Dialectic, Marx claims that his method starts from the real concrete, the world as it presents itself to us, and proceeds through abstraction, the intellectual activity of breaking this whole down into the mental units with which we think about it, to the thought concrete, the reconstituted and now understood whole present in the mind. So we're starting with the world as it presents itself to us, we're going to break it down, and then we're going to arrive at a new understanding of the world, having broken it down. What's our starting point? It's the inescapable situation in which we find ourselves, where, if we want to survive capitalism, we must purchase commodities. At the end of this, you're going to have a new understanding of that situation and what it means. Let's read on. The commodity is, first of all, an external object, a thing which through its qualities satisfies human needs of whatever kind. The nature of these needs, whether they arise, for example, from the stomach or the imagination, makes no difference. Needs here is essentially a shorthand for drives which are socially mediated. For example, getting hungry when you haven't eaten is a part of human nature. However, what we hunger for depends on the society to which we belong and what we've been brought up eating. In a capitalist society, we might hunger for, say, a McDonald's. Why we might hunger for a McDonald's specifically could be because of advertising. So if you made it through the likes of Mac and Me, you might end up with an insatiable desire for McDonald's. But that doesn't really factor into whether a McDonald's is a thing that you can buy, which is the important thing. Nor does it matter here how the thing satisfies man's need, whether directly as a means of subsistence, i.e. an object of consumption, or indirectly as a means of production. So, at this level of our analysis, the commodity could be an object of consumption, like a Happy Meal, or it could be a means of production, like the machinery needed to produce Happy Meals. What could be a commodity under capitalism is a very broad category. Every useful thing, for example, iron, paper, etc., may be looked at from the two points of view of quality and quantity. The usefulness of a thing makes it a use value, but this usefulness does not dangle in mid-air. It is conditioned by the physical properties of the commodity and has no existence apart from the latter. The use value of a pencil, for example, consists in the fact that it can be used for writing. A pencil ceases to be useful in this way once it has been sharpened so much that it is too small to hold in the hand. So the usefulness of the commodity is the fact that it satisfies a need, and that usefulness is conditioned by the commodity's physical properties. However, this doesn't mean that a commodity couldn't be something abstract or a service. Every society has to produce useful things in order for its participants to survive. But in the capitalist mode of production, objects are produced for the purpose of being exchanged. But if the thing itself is literally useless, nobody will exchange for it. So use value is a necessary condition type requirement. One thing Marx also adds later is that a thing can be useful and a product of human labour without being a commodity. Marx says that in the capitalist mode of production, these useful articles are also the bearers of exchange value. Exchange value is different from use value. Marx says, exchange value appears, first of all, as the quantitative relation, the proportion, in which use values of one kind exchange for use values of another kind. So exchange value is a ratio between quantities of commodities. X commodity A exchanges for Y commodity B. And we can imagine an endless series of different quantities of commodities which all exchange for each other. X commodity A exchanges for Y commodity B, Z commodity C, and so on. If they all exchange for each other, then they all have the same value. But how is that value determined? 
What determines the value of commodities in Marx's theory is something called socially necessary labour time, which refers to the labour time necessary to produce any use value under the conditions of production normal for a given society and at an average degree of skill and intensity of labour prevalent in that society. As the technological sophistication of a means of production increases, the labour time socially necessary for the production of a given article decreases and consequently the value of the article falls. So value is subject to change. Marx has a passage on the dual character of labour embedded in commodities. When we exchange commodities, we assume, without being aware of it, that the socially necessary labour time that goes into making them is the same. And this equal human labour, regarded as an expenditure of effort in general, is what Marx calls abstract labour. Concrete labour is labour of a specific sort which produces a useful thing, and this may vary. What Marx is trying to illustrate in general is that there is an overwhelming social interaction happening which cannot be controlled by individuals. We don't control the market, the market controls us. So what exactly does Marx mean by commodity fetishism? Commodity fetishism is not about placing an undue importance on the consumption of commodities, nor is it about certain commodities being used as status symbols. Value is not at all a property of a thing, but it is a social relation between people mediated through objects which seems like it is a property of a thing. To quote Michael Heinrich, What Marx means can be demonstrated using the example of value. On the one hand, it is clear that value is not a natural property of things, like weight or colour. But on the other, for the people in a commodity-producing society, it seems as if things in a social context automatically possess value and therefore automatically follow their own objective laws to which humans must submit. The fact that human beings don't actually control the market, but are controlled by it, is frequently expressed even by the most right-wing of economists. To quote Friedrich Hayek, The chief insight gained by modern economists is that the market is essentially an ordering mechanism, growing up without anybody wholly understanding it, that enables us to utilise widely dispersed information about the significance of circumstances of which we are mostly ignorant. Ludwig von Mises in Human Action states that this system is steered by the market. The market directs the individual's activities into those channels in which he best serves the wants of his fellow men. Marx's point is that in a market system, we act without being aware of the conditions of our action. Much of what Marx is saying in this part of his argument is rather abstract. The impersonal domination of the market, however, reflects a very real situation which has implications for society. Marx describes how people must recognise each other as owners of private property in order for a market to function. He says that there is a juridical relation whose form is the contract, whether as part of a developed legal system or not, and that this is a relation between two wills which mirrors the economic relation. He also describes the control and regulation of the money supply as functions of the state. Since the standard of money is on the one hand purely conventional, while on the other hand it must possess universal validity, it is in the end regulated by law. In what sense do markets direct the activities of individuals? Well, all commodities, that is the products of labour, are having their values measured in magnitudes of money. In a system of generalised exchange, money is the thing that stands for the exchange value of all things. Exchange value is determined by the amount of socially necessary labour time. Money is thus the direct incarnation of all human labour in capitalist society. Marx writes, money as a measure of value is the necessary form of appearance of the measure of value which is imminent in commodities, namely labour time. We are, in this sense, working for the market. And this sense that we're working for the market is going to become more profound as we discover the particular social forms that our labour takes in later parts. Now, Marx doesn't appear to tell us a story about the historical origins of money. At this point, I think it is sensible to step back from the nitty-gritty details of Marx and consider what capitalist economists are saying. 
We are, at the point of considering the historical origins of money, asked to imagine a society based on barter. We are, time and time again, asked to imagine how difficult commodity exchange would be without money. The capitalist economists presuppose mass commodity exchange as a natural facet of society and not something specific to the capitalist mode of production. That presupposition is what leads to their empty storytelling about barter. Caroline Humphrey's anthropological work on barter states that no example of a barter economy, pure and simple, has ever been described, let alone the emergence from it of money. All available ethnography suggests that there has never been such a thing. And that's quoted by David Graeber. What David Graeber finds is that barter does occur between people if trust has broken down. Given this, economists appear to be lying to us on a tremendous scale. Graeber comments that the emergence of money historically is in no way the product of commercial transactions. It was actually created by bureaucrats in order to keep track of resources and move things between departments. In Chapter 3 of Capital, Marx analyses the process of the circulation of commodities. An economy which meets human needs would seek to transfer objects from hands in which they are not useful into hands in which they are useful. Now, what happens when the laws of commodity production are left to govern this process of what Marx calls social metabolism? In a nutshell, money is directly convertible into any other commodity. If I've got a commodity, that's great. I can satisfy whatever need the commodity is designed for me to satisfy. If I've got money, I'm now opened up to the entire world of commodities. I can buy anything I want, and the more money I have, the more that principle holds. Money is thus the ultimate product of this process of commodity circulation. If that's the ultimate product, how does that affect the social metabolism? Suppose that you're an individual and you have one commodity that presumably is not useful to you and you sell it in order to buy another commodity which is useful to you. The process is commodity, money, commodity, CMC. But given that money is directly convertible into any other commodity, you're not necessarily committed to buying a specific commodity. Instead, you're opened up to the whole world of commodities by virtue of the functions of money. There you have a much greater advantage. Marx comments that commodities are thus sold not in order to buy commodities, but in order to replace their commodity form by their money form. Instead of merely being a way of mediating the metabolic process, this change of form becomes an end in itself. It is also the case that there can be a temporal split between the acquisition of a commodity and the payment for it. So we have, as well as buyers and sellers, debtors and creditors. So it is undeniable that under these conditions, some people are going to have to accumulate a reserve fund in order to pay off debts. This is not a historical argument as to how capitalist accumulation began, but in my opinion, a conceptual argument about the conditions for exploitation which capitalist accumulation continually reproduces. Lastly, a word on Marx's crisis theory. This is something which he develops in the later volumes. However, he mentions the possibility of crises in Chapter 3. Marx's analysis allows for the possibility of crises because you aren't necessarily committed to buying something because you have just sold. It is a possibility that everyone holds on to their money, but if that happens, you could have a potential problem for the system. Marx says that for the development of the possibility of crises into a reality, a whole series of conditions is required which as yet do not exist from the standpoint of simple circulation of commodities. The first three chapters of Volume 1 of Capital are among the hardest to read in the entire work. I say this from the perspective of having read the first two volumes and having begun reading the third volume. What I will say to anyone undertaking to read Capital, stick with it because it does get easier and it is worth putting in the effort to try to understand it. I initially found it very difficult to grasp his points about commodity fetishism and value particularly, and for these points I really recommend reading Michael Heinrich's introduction to the three volumes of Marx's Capital. It's very clear and concise, and everything is laid out really nicely. Finally, I just want to make a few comments to the minority of anarchists who are complaining about me reading Marx. Just because as anarchists we might disagree with the Marxist position on the state, that doesn't give us reason to disengage from Marx's economic analysis. 
Capital is one of the most interesting books I've ever read, if not the most. It is well researched and packed with invaluable insights, and it has expanded my understanding of capitalism to a great extent, and I say all of that as a committed anarchist. We are being really stupid if we think we don't need to take heed of the most extensive and robust critique of capitalism to date. This has been Libertarian Socialist Rants. Thank you very much for watching. Tune in next time for part two, which looks at the transformation of money into capital. Of course, do your bit for our global community, stay home and stay well. Full solidarity to anyone who is unable to self-isolate due to living in abusive relationships or if self-isolation means going home to an abusive family. Instead of promoting my Patreon page, I would suggest that people donate to the Swarm Collective, Sex Worker Advocacy and Resistance Movement, as they're trying to gather a hardship fund for sex workers who are among some of the most economically vulnerable at this time where physical distancing is necessary. You can make a donation at swarmcollective.org forward slash donate. All donations made to Swarm from now to the 30th of April will go directly to this fund and will provide mutual aid to sex workers in the UK who are in severe financial hardship. Stay safe and thanks for watching.